Spring has come early to this part of North London, so what better time for the leader of the opposition to set out his plans to regenerate the Labour Party? Although Keir Starmer has been in the thick of it through Brexit and now as party leader, it's easy to forget that he is comparatively new to politics. I was elected here in 2015, um, which was, uh, what, five and a half years ago. Um, and uh, it feels a lot longer now, but actually, uh, yeah. of course, it is only five and a half years. What five and a half years it's been as well? What five and a half years? Kia. That's the one. Yeah, how are you doing? Not too bad, how are you? Yeah, not too bad. You're bearing up all right. And now he faces the biggest challenge of all, to win back the voters. Thank you so much. Great, nice to Thank see you. Nice you, to you take care. You. Take care. Bye-bye Labour Party in the way. Good, fantastic. That's good to hear. But he's operating in a landscape transformed by the COVID-19 pandemic. The Prime Minister is updating the vaccine target so that every adult should have their first dose by the end of July. You must welcome the news. Absolutely welcome this news and I think the whole country will welcome the news. The vaccine is the light at the end of the tunnel and all credit to those on the front line who've been rolling this out. The NHS have done a fantastic uh, job. I've been to a number of vaccine centres and it's, it's very, very uplifting and I think uh, everybody wants to support this, so this is very welcome. So on Monday, the Prime Minister is going to start outlining the roadmap out of lockdown. What restrictions do you want to see lifted and when? Well, what I want to see from the Prime Minister is um, a cautious, careful exit from lockdown. We all want this to be the last lockdown. So we've got to come out of it in a measured way that makes sure that in a, we're not back where we started in a number of weeks or months. So roll out slowly, carefully, follow the science. I would say to the Prime Minister, publish the science. I think that will give great confidence to what he has to say uh, on Monday when he puts out the roadmap. I think the other thing is recognise that because there will be ongoing restrictions of some sort, businesses desperately need more support. It's one of the reasons we've said that the business rate relief should go on um, for another six months. VAT um, should be reduced in key areas such as hospitality. So careful, cautious, follow the science um, and make sure the support is there for business. They've got this far, they need to survive beyond the net set of restrictions. Of course, one of the really big decisions is around schools. Yeah. Uh, the government said its ambition is to open all schools to all pupils on the 8th of March. Teaching unions have said that they are worried about that, they'd prefer a more staggered approach. Which side is right? Well, ideally, I'd like to see all schools back open on the 8th of March and all children back in schools on the 8th of March. I've been worried through the pandemic, a number of people have, about the impact of being out of school has on particularly vulnerable children and the attainment gap is getting bigger. So ideally, the 8th of March. We'll have to see, obviously, where the data is, see where the science is, but that's what we should be working towards. If that means more testing, if that means Nightingale classrooms, if it means other measures, let's do that because I want to get our kids back into school. So the teaching unions who are saying that it should be staggered, it should be different year groups, you don't support that? Well, ideally, uh, we want to see all those children back on the 8th of March. That's what the Prime Minister said would happen. We're going to have to go carefully. Of course we are. We're going to have to look at the detail and the data as we go into those uh, weeks just before the 8th of March, see where we are on the infection rates. But, you know, I've always been concerned about the impact on children being out of school. But, you know, actually, I think if we do this together, we can get through this. Um, another um, big issue some people are talking about is this idea of vaccine passports. The idea that you would need a passport to go into a pub or into a restaurant. Is that something that you think is a good idea? Well, I think it depends. And it's a very, very difficult issue. Let me be absolutely clear about that. And I, I think people giving yes, no answers uh, is a risky business here. I think internationally, it's probably inevitable that some sort of vaccine passport is going to come into being. You already see that in some countries for yellow fever and other um, infections. So I think internationally, it's almost inevitable. I think the collecting of the data is important. So we need one place where the data is stored, you know, who's been vaccinated, how can you access those records, etc. Vaccine passports within the UK, I think, is something we need a national debate about. It is very difficult uh, to see how it would work, but, um, you know, let's tread very, very carefully on this. Where are and your I, instincts, I, I, though? What, what, what's your instinct, Tony? Well, I'd be very worried, for example, if we got to a situation where it was suggested that people would lose their job if they hadn't had a vaccine. On the other hand, I can, of course, see the concerns people would have about their own safety, perhaps in their home, 
in their teams at work, etc. And that's why I really think on this one, we need a proper national debate. Let's not pretend there's an easy yes, no answer because there isn't one. Now, you were elected leader last April. Yeah. COVID has dominated absolutely everything since. And there has been some criticism that you haven't shown enough leadership on COVID. You haven't taken enough risks, called for things before they were inevitable. I mean, I'm thinking about people like Tony Blair, for example, who called first for the spacing between the doses. Rory Stewart, who at the beginning of last year was calling for lockdowns before other people. Do you think there's been a tendency for you only to really call for things once they were already going to happen? Well, the approach I took was the approach I set out on the very first day I became leader of the Labour Party. And that was to recognise that this is a pandemic, a global pandemic with huge challenges. And I said what we would do is we would support the government where we thought they were doing the right thing and challenge them where we thought they were wrong. So, for example, on the lockdowns, on the restrictions, we have supported the government, voted with the government on those lockdowns, and that was the right thing to do, and I think the public expected us to do that. And then we've challenged them where they're wrong. Actually, if you look at probably my two biggest challenges to the government, the first was in the autumn when I said, having looked at the medical advice, uh, we need to go into a circuit break or a lockdown, um, and it wasn't just before the government did it, on the contrary. Boris Johnson scoffed at the idea, said there was no way he was going to It was still three lockdown. weeks well, before Sage recommended it, though. You weren't exactly leading the debate when people well, the, were already calling for it. The minutes were published three, month, three weeks after they were written. As soon as we saw them, we called for it. But the argument that um, somehow the government was about to do it, the Prime Minister scoffed at me and said he's not going to go into a lockdown. Three weeks later, he did it. We had the same thing at Christmas when I stood up and challenged the Prime Minister and said, look, this Christmas mixing is heading for trouble. He stood at the dispatch box and said to me, you want to cancel Christmas, I'm not going to do it. A few days later, he U-turned. So the idea that we've only called for things just before the government's about to do it, actually, I don't think, in fairness, is, bad, is borne out by uh, the examples that I've just given. OK, um, a really simple question for you. Um, Matt Hancock has been found to have acted unlawfully uh, over not publishing these yeah. COVID contracts. Should he resign? I don't want to call for him to resign. Um, I do think he's wrong about the contracts. There's been a lot of problems with the contracts on transparency, on who the contracts have gone to, and there's been a lot of wasted money. And I think that is a real cause for concern. But at the moment, at this stage of the pandemic, I want all government ministers working really hard to get us through this because, you know, whatever political differences, what the public know is this needs to succeed. The vaccine rolled out needs to succeed. And I think in those circumstances, what I'd say to Matt Hancock is you need to you know, go further on the vaccine, go faster on the vaccine. You need to have a roadmap on Monday from the Prime Minister. But I think at this stage, calling for people to resign is not what the public really wants to see. Now, I'm keen to throw forwards because some of the big challenges are going to be about rebuilding the economy, re rebuilding the country post uh, the current crisis. Uh, you, of course, gave a big speech this week. What should a post-COVID economy look like? Well, we're getting to a real fork in the road. Um, the vaccine, I think, gives us that hope that we will come out of this. And then the question, the critical question, which I think will define you know, the next general election, probably the next 10 years is, do we, when we come out of this, want to go back to where we started and repair what we had, go back? And I say no because what we had before this was an economy which was uh, unequal and insecure. Um, and we've had 10 years of austerity and it's caused such inequality and such insecurity for people in the economy. So we take a different path, which is to go forward to a different and better future where we have a government, an active government, working with business to tackle inequality, not only because it's a wrong in itself, but because inequality doesn't work for a good economy. So that's the, going to be the big political choice you say, coming up, and I'm very clear which direction Labour will go on this. Have you been a bit disingenuous here, though? Because you said that the government wants to go back, they want to build back, but you've quite conveniently missed out the better bit, didn't you? Build back better, well, the, which is very different meaning. Well, if the government is prepared to say that they recognise that after 10 years of a Conservative government, the model we had going into the pandemic... But they do. They say that they no, don't no, no, want austerity. They don't want to if, return if, to austerity. If they recognise that the model was um, unjust, insecure and unequal, 
uh, then let me hear the Prime Minister say that that is the result of the first of the 10 years we've had of Conservative government, because that is their track record. And if you look at the Chancellor, true it is, true it is that um, they've put in measures and the state has had to be active in the last 10 months or so. But that's necessity. That's not a values judgment. Uh, and what the, cha the Chancellor's instinct is how quickly can I extricate for myself from this, withdraw those measures, not how long do they need to be in for. Uh, and the other bit of evidence I'd just throw in here is that whatever the Prime Minister says about the state and the future and levelling up, just look at some of the decisions in the last few months. Um, you know, the refusal to keep the uplift in universal credit, council tax rises um, for people across the country, and a pay freeze for police officers and those on the front line. These are not the hallmarks uh, of a government that is serious uh, about dealing with inequality and the insecurity that is baked into our economy. But if you, if you look at the decisions they made over the last year, you have to look at the furlough scheme as well. Can't, you can't just say ignore the furlough scheme, that huge government intervention that we saw, but just look at these bits. No, no, you no, either not, look at them on the record the last year or you don't. I'm not suggesting we ignore that. Of course they've taken measures. Um, we've supported those measures. We think they should have gone further in various places, but that's to one side. But they've done that for necessity. The idea that this is some conversion from the uh, Conservative Party, a way that can conveniently forget the last 10 years and they've converted to social democracy, uh, I think is completely wrong. Now, I'm keen to find out more about you, about what you believe in and the kind of country that you want to build. So early this month, a Labour strategy document was linked to The Guardian and they talked to focus groups who said that people are confused about what we stand for and what our purpose is and they also think that you need to stop sitting on the fence. So I want to find out a bit more about the real Keir Starmer, you know, banning the kind of generalities that no one would disagree with, like fairness. What is it that you really stand for? A driving determination to root out inequality and insecurity in our country, in our society, in our economy, and to build a better future for Britain. Yes, I'm patriotic. That was one of the issues that was in this report that was leaked. Of course I'm patriotic. Um, I want to be Prime Minister of this country because I want this country to be even better than it is now. Actually, the whole Labour movement is very patriotic. We, we are in politics to change our country for the better. You can't be more patriotic than that, and I'm very, very comfortable with it. I just wonder if it's, it does sound quite general still, though, doesn't it, that you want to build a better country, that you want to stop inequality. I mean, no-one would really disagree with that, would they? Well, I don't think it's general to say that the economic model that we've had for a decade has completely failed and we need to sweep it away and bring in something where you have an active government tackling inequality, tackling insecurity and working actively with business as a business partnership going forward. And the, the forward-looking businesses know that the days of deregulation, the days when you don't need to worry about the climate uh, emergency are over. And actually there's a real opportunity there to, to shape a better Britain for the next generation. That is what pulsed through my veins. That's what I want to achieve. And if we can take the Labour Party from where it is now to where we need to be to win the next general election, that is what we'll do. OK, I'm keen to talk about a few specifics now, just to get a bit of a sense about where you start, stand on some of these key issues. So immigration. In the Labour leadership, you promised to defend free movement as we leave the EU. You've now dropped that pledge. Well, so we've left the EU and free um, movement has gone, is the reality of the situation. And we'll, we'll face a different situation in 2024 because we have left free movement has gone. But would therefore, you like to have free movement? Well, we're going to have to have a fair and humane immigration system and we will set out what that is in 2024. But uh, free movement has gone and, and you can't flick a switch uh, on this. Free movement depended on membership of the EU, depended on membership of the single market uh, and we're at a different place now. How about drugs? Do you think there's a case for decriminalising cannabis possession? I've never subscribed to that view. I've, uh, when I was Director of Pro uh, Public Prosecutions, I prosecuted many, many cases, or my team did, uh, involving drugs and drug gangs and the criminality that sits behind. Um, and it causes huge um, issues uh, um, to vulnerable people across the country. So I've never gone down that route. Um, there were some initiatives in some parts of the country where cautions were given for low-level crimes. I think there may be something in that. But in principle, I've seen too, too much of the damage that sits behind drugs um, for 
uh, me to go down that route. So the current policy you think is roughly right? Well, it's roughly right. Of course, you know, um, there's always room for a grown-up debate about exactly how we deal with these cases. But what sits behind uh, drugs is the criminality, the gangs. And, you know, uh, if I look in my own constituency at some of the issues in relation to knife crime, which is blighting the lives of young people, Sitting just behind that are county lines and drug running, and that's the kind of impact it has on our society. Um, how about um, trans issues as well? Do you think that trans women should have access to women-only spaces, such as um, prisons, for example, or toilets or refuges? Well, look, trans rights are human rights, and, and the trans community are amongst the most abused and discriminated of any community, and we need to absolutely understand that and have a grown-up discussion about how we go forward. I don't think we're in the right place on trans rights. I think we should go further than the current legislation. But what I don't want is this war that's going on at the moment by you know, two different groups fighting each other in a way that we can't make progress. So you say you want to go further. In what way? Well, I think that if you look at the legislation that's in place, it, the, the processes and procedures are demeaning. Um, and there's too many stories of how demeaning it is that I've heard for myself. We must be able to do better than that. I have, of course, um, dealt, uh, when I was Director of Public Prosecutors, with many women who've been through um, domestic abuse, domestic violence, etc. And I know how precious some of the spaces are uh, that they need um, to be secure, uh, to be safe. And, and therefore, uh, there are no easy answers here. And as I say, just, just taking lumps out of each other, pretending there's a yes, no answer to everything, I think is wrong. Now, just before we finish, uh, Lisa Nandy said in an interview uh, last month that Joe Biden is a woke guy whose victory was a source of hope for Labour. Are you a woke guy? Well, I am. A, what I think about President Biden is the values that drove him through his campaign and the values that he's putting on show as uh, a president. And I, I admire those values. I think it's a shot in the arm for... Um, for global politics, shot in the arm for politics here, um, and I'm, I'm a values-led um, person, and I think that is what Joe Biden is. And is that a woke guy? Well, look, it's a values-led uh, person, and um, just banding words around don't help. I'm values-driven. I'm utterly determined uh, that we can do something to tackle inequality, to tackle insecurity, um, and that we can do that sooner than we think if we... Uh, pulled together as a party, pulled together as a movement. We obviously lost very badly in December 2019. I am convinced, and I'm fighting every day, week, month and year into 2024, uh, that we can turn this around um, and bring a Labour government in in 2024 and make the difference we need for our country. I mean, some people would say, though, that, you know, you, you say you can turn it around, but we've had 116,000 deaths related to covid the worst economic hit since the great frost in the early 1700s, and yet you're still behind in the polls. Well, look, we're living through a terrible pandemic. A year ago, I was in the leadership race to become the leader of the Labour Party, and journalists were saying to me, is the Labour Party even going to survive, Keir? Um, so that was the challenge put to me 12 months ago. Now, people are putting to me, are you going to form the next government? Well, that tells you how far we've come. Did I think this was a one-year project, that we could turn around the worst loss since 1935 in 12 months? No, I didn't. Do I think competence is enough? No, I don't. Do I think it's a four-year journey? Yes, I do. In the leadership election, uh, I asked you which former Labour leader you'd compare yourself to. It's a question you're quite familiar with, so I'm going to ask something that I think you probably haven't been asked before. You're an Arsenal fan. What Arsenal player would you compare yourself to? Oh, every time I'm asked about my football skills, I say I'm like this, that or the other. And all the guys I play football with, they text me straight away and say, in your head, in your dreams. So um, I'm just going to tell you that Thierry Henry is my favourite Arsenal but who, player. But who would you compare yourself to? I'm a midfield player in the middle of the pitch. I like to think I'm a box-to-box -box player, which means across the whole pitch. But I now know that as this goes out, there will be plenty of people who've played football with me saying... Uh, in your dreams, Kia. Um, you grew up in Surrey. How come you are an Arsenal fan? Well, because um, I've been a football fan all my life. Arsenal was a team that I first started supporting. Um, and now, of course, they're my local team. So I'm a season ticket holder and I can walk from my house to Arsenal. It takes about 25 minutes and that is fantastic. Thank you very much, Kirsten. Thank you.